Hi, I'm Alexei. Here I've taken my live Sigby talk and edited in subtitles, PowerPoint slides, and cleaned up the sound a bit. Thank you to Laura Byrne for filming. You can see the main result of this study in the title, that salt licks are located disproportionately away from marine coastlines. coastlines. Here's a quote at the bottom to put you in the mood, and enjoy. Uh, so every animal has uh, a threshold, a sodium uh, threshold. For humans, uh, according to the American Heart Association, it's 500 milligrams. Um, and as predators, uh, when we eat meat, about 0.9 kilos of steak has enough sodium in it without anything being added to satisfy minimum dietary threshold of 500 milligrams. Whereas nobody on a salt diet, even the craziest salt diet, goes below one milligram per day. Um, but that's physiologically the limit. And we're actually comprised of about 1% sodium, um, so is the, the ocean. And it's, uh, it's been proposed as a seventh macronutrient because it drives uh, a lot of ecology. Um, plants contain very little sodium, and if you add any to their so the solution, they end up really not doing well. There's some plants that can mangroves that are specialists, uh, hal uh, halophiles, uh, halophiles, but most are halophobes. And so herbivores are yeah, not having a good time if all they're consuming is uh, plants for their salt intake, especially uh, ungulates that are lactating um, or giving birth or even just for growth, you need more, even more salt. Um, and then if you're you know, consuming nothing but grass all the spring and then there's too much, uh, there's a lot of potassium and not enough salt and there's uh, these potassium sodium pumps that, uh, up, that ends up triggering the aldosterone upregulation that makes, basically makes animals diarrhea a lot, and then uh, they lose a lot of magnesium, which makes them go into something called grass technique in the ranching industry where you know, the magnesium is necessary for muscles to relax. So you just end up, you know, shooting yourself and spazzing out and uh, salt licks are very important. <laughs> and here's some uh, gaur, I've never even heard of these uh, kind of cattle, but this is the Wikipedia salt licks, that's the Wiki Commons picture there. And this is a wet mineral lick. Um, you see it's a little bit muddy and there's uh, pools of water. Um, you get alpine goats uh, at dry licks, right? There's actually like hundreds more. It's just, I have to zoom in a little here. Uh, and they're just licking salt off the side of the rock. There's some pretty famous photos of them doing that off the side of uh, dams. For some reason, there's a lot of sodium besides the dams. You got it in the bottom of the trees, right? So here's a white-tailed deer lick. Uh, because trees, they, they hate salt, so they're, they're, any salt that they do end up accumulating in the, in the process. They shunt into the roots, and they are in the, these, uh, near the roots. So you know when the trees are dying or you know, not dying, um, the deer will dig up the salt from the base of some trees. Chimpanzees also do this. They'll eat clay off of fallen trees out of the bottom. Um, we think it's for the salt. But there's a lot of, I'll get into that, there's a lot of other reasons. Yeah, so you got scarlet macaws that eat clay from riverbanks in the Peruvian Amazon. Because the middle of the Amazon has got a uh, very salt deprived uh, area. And then for a long time people thought, well, they're eating it to detoxify things in their diet, but uh, studies where they're trapping their diet uh, are, are seeing that, well, actually they're not eating these toxic plants and still going to the clay licks. Uh, so they're probably in it more for the sodium, but none of these are mutually exclusive. Um, there is salt in topsoil, the first zero to five centimeters. Uh, this is a USGS thing, and they have samples from across the, the country. And you can see it's like two to six percent sodium in the soil out west. Uh, if you eat 50 grams of dirt from many of these yellow to red areas, you get enough salt for the minimum threshold. But people with pica that eat dirt, uh, you know, we get a lot of bad, um, bad things that will happen. It has heavy metals, there's uh, parasites in the soil, and there's a lot of indigestion that comes from that. So don't just eat any dirt, you got to eat your good dirt. 
Um, it's also fully salt correlates with uh, soil sodium, right? So that's a very nice thing. It's from a study from around the world and different areas. So you know, it's just grasses and all kinds of vegetation. Uh, but even if there is some salt in the plants, there's targeted herbivory. So this is a uh, nutrient supplemented unfenced plot on this blue line here, and that means that when they when this same study gave uh, nutrients to these plots, animals would preferentially consume, oops, uh, would preferentially consume plants with higher sodium. So there's the conclusion was there may be like an evolutionary trend, or not evolutionary, but like a natural history trend where plants with that do tend to be more tolerant of uh, uh, soil sodium get consumed more. So they're at like lower uh, abundance. Uh, generally because of herbivore pressure. Um, so now we arrive to uh, Salt Lake, and I'll show you some data. I've redacted a lot of it to not uh, overwhelm the eye here, but um, so here you have, uh, this is in Borneo, right? So it's about a hundred, a little over hundred kilometers inland. Uh, and you got a few licks here, the 59 sample average, and you see the sodium is uh, like, oh, you know, more than a hundred times greater than uh, water. So the control is just water springs, and these are uh, water samples from um, natural licks. And so you'd have to drink 70 liters of uh, water to get a human physiological threshold of sodium uh, versus uh, less than a liter of this uh, mineral lick water to get the same. Uh, so from an animal's point of view, that's even larger. Um, it's a good, it's a good idea. And then here you have uh, the uh, sodium within diets. You know, there's like fruits and lianas and other herbs here, but really the mean is, and this is a, they didn't scale it the same way, micrograms and milligrams. If you ever publish two tables, just don't do that. You know, it's like a thousand time fold difference. But still, like 0 0.17 milligrams per gram of uh, sodium in plants, 0 0.11, so grass has even less sodium than most vegetation. As a human, if you were to try to get your sodium from grass, you'd need to eat four and a half kilos of it to get the minimum dietary threshold. So again, this is just the driving the importance of these solids. Now on to uh, the, the study. Uh, so the study I did was a biogeographic, and I didn't actually sample anything. I'll, I'll get to that. I, I collected all the data, uh, everything published on salt licks uh, in North America. Um, but the, the, the study kind of comes off of this uh, this idea that you have wind blowing over the oceans and it's blowing salt onto the land. And so uh, wind currents over oceans blow salt onto the land. There's this nifty uh, US CPA uh, program, National Atmospheric Deposition Program, that tracks all these different chemicals that blow out of the continental US. And so you can see here, it's really weird units, kilograms per hectare, but a lot more of them uh, on the coastlines. And uh, let's see, oh yeah, the, you have dry deposition and wet deposition, which is like whether the salt water or just sodium is getting picked up and blown over in a dry or wet. This is total deposition. Uh, and you can see here, this, the Great Salt Lake is uh, actually just to the left of this blob here. So it's, uh, and so we're going to try to combine those. And this is just wind currents from November 22nd, right? So like the Gulf Coast, as you know, it changes and hurricanes blow a lot inland during the summer. Um, but you can see here, like, you know, the way the wind is just uh, this red area. Um, and then here you have a lot of uh, topography, a lot of high elevation that prevents the sodium from going further inland. And a lot of this is actually piggybacking on studies that my uh, co-author and uh, PhD advisor did with uh, these other guys in Kuwait, uh, where they gave ants uh, cafeteria. Uh, and this is from, I think this is like deep in the Amazon. Uh, and the ants are all about the weekly, slightly salty cotton swab. They don't care about the sugar at all, uh, which is pretty remarkable. And so they showed that the higher, the further away you go uh, from the coastlines, the 
high more of a driver there is for salt, uh, especially starting at about 100 kilometers inland out to 1,000 kilometers. Um, so this is my, uh, whoops, my undergraduate. Uh, well, I did this, I learned ArcGIS as a graduate student, but I started this as an undergrad. Uh, I subdivided a map of the continent of the United States into 100 kilometer increments, uh, and then plotted all of these salt lakes um, across the, the entire uh, uh, Sands Mexico uh, continent. I just zoom in for people in the back, you know, the, each uh, lake location has a little number inside of it. And here's Austin, so there's actually enough sodium from the Gulf Coast uh, to be able to, um, you know, have enough, provide enough sodium here. Uh, so there are 345 distinct licks throughout this, uh, but I made it so that I aggregated them so that they're not within 100 kilometers of each other, you know, to avoid pseudo replication. Um, yeah, and we got all these, uh, every ungulate in North America has been recorded on the salt licks, even pronghorn antelopes, which there aren't a lot of. Um, but there's one lick where, you know, they're, they're uh, documented. And then, yeah, so there's significant, uh, you, you have more licks that are uh, inland than you would expect by chance, right? So by chance, the first 100 kilometers is 16% of the land mass, so you expect 16% of licks to be within 100 kilometers of the coastline. And there's actually nine, um, and, all, and that's statistically significant, all the way out to 500 kilometers is fewer than you'd expect. And so a lot of them are actually in the Rocky Mountains and sub a lot of inland here in the Appalachians. Uh, and a lot of the lifts, so this is the average elevation within each of these um, uh, distances, and all of the salt lakes are significantly at high elevations. Uh, these nine lifts are within 100 kilometers, um, and uh, in these cases, you can explain why that happens with topography. Right? So you've got uh, you know, these licks, uh, this barrier, uh, there's a little high elevation there. Uh, I get in Alaska, if I see well, it's like a ring of mountains and then there's a salt lake in the middle. Um, and then over here, we have these uh, four licks that are in the Arctic, they're ice licks. Literally, ice that's saltier than the rest of the ice. But you can see there's not a lot of marine deposition most of the year, uh, so they're not really they're in the same sense within marine coastlines. Uh, human settlement really affects all of this, right? You get salting of the roads all over the place, uh, and you get sites like this, um, and it's a whole problem, right? It attracts all of these big animals that cars that they're, they're, they're into the salt. And even, given all of that, you just look at a signal like this, it's pretty remarkable. Um, you could also ask, well, what about populations? Are there even, the, the ranges even go to the coastlines? And yeah, they do, they're actually, they've even increased, both on the East Coast and the West Coast for the deer. If you do this study with just deer and just the United States, it's still significant. Um, there are salt licks that are thousands of years old, um, you know, with all of these extinct animal fossilized bones. This is up in, uh, by Cincinnati, Tennessee. I right, visited, a good chance. Uh, if you want to ascribe directly to uh, uh, the patterns of salt deposition of uh, marine sources to lick visitation, need to do a lot of work, actually. It's uh, really, to actually do the field work for this would be uh, very uh, challenging, but you know, you have to sample extensively, water and diet, you have to, getting these physiological and dietary sodium thresholds is hard, and you get, uh, you know, it changes throughout the year and uh, throughout life history, but then you can get the dietary shortfall, figure out the rates of the licks, do a comparative study from multiple sites, and then you can use artificial licks. And that's the talk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, got some time for questions. Or I could show you another slide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, this is, these are all like places with the word lick uh, in the Ohio River Basin. You know, it's uh, pretty important stuff.